Good morning. So when I was in graduate school, I was a runner, and a friend and I decided that we we're going to run the Boston Marathon. And so we started training, and we overtrained, and I developed knee and back problems. So I went to see a physical therapist, and they told me that I had to stop running, and instead I should just stretch. As I was leaving the therapist's office, the physical therapist's office, um, I saw an ad for a vigorous yoga class that promised not only to promote flexibility, but also to promote strength and um, cardiorespiratory fitness. So I thought, oh, well, this is a great way that I can stretch, but also remain in shape, and maybe I could even still run the Boston Marathon. So I went to the yoga class, and um, I really enjoyed it, except for when the teacher would make all sorts of claims, you know, all sorts of medical claims, but also all sorts of you know, claims about, oh, yes, it'll help you, you know, increase your compassion and open your heart. And it's just like, you know, my eyes would roll. And uh, you know, I'd think, yeah, 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 I'm here for, you know, to stretch. But what, was, <laughs> you know, but what was interesting was that after a couple of weeks, I started noticing some of these changes. I started noticing that I was calmer and that I was better able to handle difficult situations and that, indeed, I was feeling more compassionate and open-hearted towards other people, and I was better able to see things from other people's point of view. And, um, you know, I was like, hmm, you know, how could this be? How could this be? And um, I thought, well, maybe, you know, it's just a placebo response, right? She told me I was going to feel this, so maybe that's, that's why I was feeling it. So I decided to do a literature search to see if there's any research on this. And lo and behold, there was quite a bit showing um, both yoga and meditation are extremely effective for decreasing stress, they're also very good for reducing symptoms associated with numerous diseases, including depression, anxiety, pain, and insomnia. They also, um, there's a couple of very good studies demonstrating it can actually improve your ability to pay attention. And most interestingly, I thought, virtually every study has shown that people are just happier. They report a, they're more satisfied with their life, and they have a higher quality of life. And so um, this was interesting to me. And so I decided to switch and start doing this sort of research. And um, so as a neuroscientist, you know, how could this be happening? What's, you know, how can you, something as silly as a yoga posture or sitting and watching your breath, how could that lead to all these sorts of different types of uh, uh, changes? So what we know is that whenever you engage in a behavior over and over again, that this can lead to changes in your brain. And this is what's referred to as neuroplasticity. And what this just means is that uh, your brain is plastic and that the neurons can change how they talk to each other with experience. And so um, and there was a couple of studies demonstrating that you can actually detect this using machines like the MRI machine. The first study was with juggling. They took people who had never, ever juggled before, and they scanned them. And then they taught them how to juggle, and they said, keep practicing for three months. Then they brought them back after three months, and they scanned them a second time. And they found that they could actually detect with the MRI machine changes in the amount of gray matter in the brain of these people in areas that are important for detecting visual motion. So I thought, OK. Three months, you know, um, can we detect, you know, can meditation change brain structure too? You know, that's something as, you know, as simple as, you know, juggling. What about meditation? So the first study we did, we recruited um, a bunch of people from the Boston area, and these were not monks or meditation teachers. These were just average Joes who on average practice meditation about 30 or 40 minutes a day. And we put them in the scanner, and we compared them to a group of people who are demographically matched, but who don't meditate. And what we found is this, that there were indeed several regions of the brain that had more gray matter in the meditators compared to the controls. Um, one of the regions I'm going to point out to you is here in the front of the brain. is an area that's important for working memory and executive decision making. And what was interesting about it was when we actually plotted the data versus their ages. So here in the red squares, that's the controls. And this is something you see actually, it's been well documented that as we get older, not just there, but across most of our cortex, it actually shrinks as we get older. And this is part of the reason why as we get older, it's um, harder to figure things out and to, um, to, to, um, you know, to remember things. And what was interesting was that in this one region, the 50-year-old meditators had the same amount of cortex as the 25-year-olds, suggesting that meditation practice may actually slow down or prevent um, the natural age-related decline in cortical structure. So now the critics, and there were many critics, said, well, you know, meditators, they're weird. Maybe they're just like that before they started practicing, right? Or a lot of them, you know, they're vegetarians, so maybe it has something to do with their diet or something else for their lifestyle, you know. Couldn't possibly be the meditation, it had something else, right? And to be fair, um, 
you know, that, that could be true. You know, we, this first study could not address that. So we did a second study. Um, in this study, what we did is we took people who had never meditated before, and we put them in the scanner, and then we put them through an eight-week meditation-based stress reduction program where they were told to meditate every day for 30 to 40 minutes. And then we scanned them again at the end of the eight weeks, and this is what we found. So what you can see is that um, several areas became larger. In this slide, we can see the hippocampus. Um, and in the graph, the controls are in blue and the uh, meditation subjects are in red. And what we see is that um, the hippocampus, and this is an area that's important for learning and memory. It's also important for emotion regulation. And um, what's interesting is there's less gray matter in this region in people who have depression and PTSD. Another region we identified was the temporal parietal junction, which is here above your ear. And it's important for perspective taking and empathy and compassion. And again, these are both functions which people report changing when they start practicing meditation and yoga. Another region we identified was the amygdala. And the amygdala is the fight or flight part of your brain. And here, we actually found a decrease in gray matter. And what was interesting was that the change in gray matter was correlated with the change in stress. So the more stress reduction people reported, the smaller the amygdala became. And this was really interesting um, because it's sort of the opposite and parallel of what the, some uh, animal studies have shown. So Chatterjee and uh, colleagues using rodents, um, they took rodents who were just happy, normal rodents, and they had them in their cage, and they measured their amygdala, and then they put them through a 10-day stress regimen. And at the end of the 10 days, they measured their amygdala, and this exact same analogous part of their rat brain grew. So we found a decrease in, with stress, they found an increase with stress. What was interesting is that then they left the animals alone, and three weeks later, they went back and tested them again. And three weeks later, that same part of the amygdala was still large, and the animals, even though they were in their original cages where they were happy, were still acting stressed out. So they you know, were cowering in the corner, and they just weren't exploring the space the way they had before. Um, and so this is the exact opposite of what we saw with the humans, because with the humans, nothing has changed with their environment. They still had their stressful jobs, all the difficult people in their lives are still being difficult, and the economy still sucked, but <laughs> yet you know, their amygdala got smaller, and they were reporting less stress. And so together, these really show that the change in the amygdala, it's not responding to the change in the environment, but rather it's representing the change in the people's re uh, reaction and relationship to their environment. Um, and then the other thing that the study shows us is that um, it's also, it wasn't just that people were saying, oh, I feel better, or um, that it was a placebo response, or that they were trying to please us, that there was an actual neurobiological reason why they were saying they felt less stressed. And so the idea that I'd like to share with all of you today is that meditation can literally change your brain. Thank you.